wrap it up here today, and I want to do it with one core notion, one core belief I want to leave with you. And it really is the summary, of, for me, of at least 30 years of my career. And it's the one learning that is innovation is culture. I believe that so deeply in my heart that everything you do comes rooted in culture. And so I want to share, you, share with you today exactly what I mean and, and give you some specific examples. And the place to begin is back when I was a little kid. Because when I, from the time I was six years old, I knew I was going to be an engineer. Now, I couldn't have said that I was going to be an engineer, but I had all of the classic traits. I loved to take things apart. I loved to figure out how they worked. And sometimes I even put them back together. So I would take my mom's chair, I would disassemble it, and I would take all the screws out, and then I would figure out how to put the rocking chair back together. I would go figure out how to fix TVs at the time. Well, TVs were pretty primitive. We had the tubes, and, and, and it was all very, very simple electronics. But I had a buddy, and he, he, he was a, a technician, and he would teach me how to do it. So I would go fix the TVs. And then I built my first computer. I built my first stereo. And all along the way, what I was doing was building up a set of skills. And I never realized it at the time. But what I learned when I look back on that, and I think about that exact moment, and I think about all of the examples since then, all of my job assignments, all of the places I worked, everything came down to innovation is culture. What worked and why I ended up being who I am was because I was in an environment that valued culture, excuse me, that valued innovation. So a perfect example here as a kid, my parents put me in an environment that allowed me to take things apart. And by taking them apart, they knew the risk that they may not come completely together. But they suspended judgment with me, and they allowed me to explore that. Same thing when I took my first job, same exact experience. When I moved to Intel, same exact experience. So what I want to do now is share with you what, how you develop and how we look at developing an innovative culture. And I'm going to do it in three ways. First, I'm going to share with you how we look at the future and how we sell that internally, how we sell it externally. And that really starts with talking about people and what's going on in our society. People always ask me, geez, you, you work in a really cool place. You, get a, you, know, you run HP Labs. You've got all sorts of cool stuff in there. How, how do you figure out what the future is? And I can tell you, one, you don't ever figure out what the future is. But the way you gain insight is not by looking at the technology. Those become the tools. The way you gain insight is by looking at the societal changes, looking at what's going on around you. Because that, in the broadest way, is culture. So I'm going to start with that and share with you how we look at it. Second, I'm going to share with you the vision. And you'll get an insight about where we're going. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but I'll give you a few snippets. But the important part about that is not the vision, but it's how we got to it. And you'll see right in here, innovation is culture. And it's bringing aspects of the people out and bringing that forward to develop that vision. And then the last one, I want to come back to how do we do that? How do we do that as leaders? How do we overcome some of those barriers? So with that, let's dive right in. In HP Labs, we're charged with, you know, what's the future? Where are we going? And the way we develop it is we look 30 years in the future. And we don't look at technology. We stand back and we look at the societal changes. We look at the demographics. We look at how the world around us is changing how our lives are colliding and intersecting. And then we try and take from it the little pieces of what is going to be so fundamental that we have to do something different. And then we go figure out how to solve that. So I bring forward just a few here. One, rapid urbanization. Now, we know that. You know, many of us live in big cities. In fact, within the next 30 years, what you're going to see is over half of the world's population will live in big cities. In 1990, 
There were 10 megacities. A megacity is defined as a city of over 10 million people. By 2025, there will be 41. By 2030, there will be over 50 megacities. Now, those cities are going to have entirely different needs, right? First of all, you're going to have congestion, as you see here. This is actually a picture in Delhi on the left. That congestion is going to fundamentally change how we do products. You're not going to be able to get products in, get, pro uh, get waste out. Energy will be much more constrained. Resources will be much more valuable. So our concurrent process by which we go about designing products will have to be fundamentally different. Second, changing demographics. Now today, we all target the millennials. That is the who's setting the agenda. That's who we want to recruit for the next generation. That's who we go after. And we certainly do that from an HP standpoint. But zoom forward now over the next 30 years, and those demographics will change radically. You'll watch an aging population where in that same time frame, you're suddenly going to see that the majority of people are actually over 50. And the reason is people are living longer, more advanced health care, more advanced capabilities to keep people alive and to make them thrive. And that is going to create a whole slew of different technologies, a whole slew of other needs that will need to be met, fundamentally driven by health care and unique, unique solutions for making people thrive. It's going after what you call the silver spenders. The third big one is hyperglobalization. And hyperglobalization, we all know, is that ideas spread very quickly, right? That an idea that's created in one place can very rapidly be in another place. And this gets enabled really by the internet, and so much of it is fueled by our social trends. But that is what's going on from a social side. What is really interesting is when you put these together and you look at hyper-globalization, uh, you move to a concept that we believe that will be called glocalization. And that is the idea that one product, one idea, can move in a digital form to somewhere else, can be modified, changed, enhanced, and recreated in a physical form in that environment and can all be done instantly. And by going after and solving some of these basic human needs, some of these societal needs, that we in the broader culture are faced with, you can create some of the more innovative approaches about how you solve, solve these issues. So with that, at HP, what we did is we created a simple vision. And that simple vision we call blended reality. Now, blended reality is a very simple notion. It's really the intersection of our physical life, right? The people, places, things with our digital life or our digital experiences where we compute, we communicate, we share, we act. Now, the key is to do this in a seamless and virtuous cycle. We've seen it all done in clumsy ways where the technology is separate, and that's usually how most of the things start, where it's an independent, separate effort. But what the key is is how do you get this in an integrated way where suddenly the technology disappears, where it's suddenly integral into your life? Now, by the way, it's happened all over and through our lives in many of the examples I just showed you from a society standpoint. Medical, in the areas of medicine, we now have machines that connect up to you. They actually physically analyze your blood, and they can look for aspects about it, and they can turn back around and act on it in a digital domain, turn back around and apply things to correct uh, your blood and to make you well. Think of diab uh, a diabetic. You see it in things like agriculture, right? Agriculture, where you have you know great big field and you got a tractor running around it, and you go, "Wow, that's just you know that's uh, that's farming." But I had an, uh, I had a very interesting conversation yesterday. Yesterday, we announced um, HP Tech Ventures, which is our uh, our venture investment wing. I had a conversation afterwards with an interesting gentleman, and he was the head of innovation for a soybean company. And I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I had a fascinating conversation that was absolutely amazing relative to farming. Because what has happened is, in soybean, it's all about how, or farming in general, how do I maximize that production? So what's happened is, built into the tractors, the ability to real-time sense the soil, to be able to turn back around and apply the appropriate amount of nitrates, where they're actually using imaging from NASA, where they can look at fields and analyze the contents of those fields, use that to act on it. Now, all of that has totally disappeared. You never see any of that, right? It has become 
that virtuous cycle here, that blended reality, where it is all happening from the physical to the digital and back to the physical. I'm going to give you three examples, and we're going to go right to innovation as culture and how that happened. So first example is hypermobility, a big belief of what we think will happen within that context of a changing society. Now today we know this as the tablets, phablets, and phones that we all you know, use today. It's those things that we stare at 137 times a day. And I agree with you completely, Karen. It's something that ultimately it's a disruption you want to sit down and stand away from. But what happens when that technology then is embedded on you and it disappears, but it is helping you? And it will come. You see it today in the wearables that you have that sit around your wrist that are measuring your heart rate that ultimately will measure your, your, your temperature, that will measure the moisture, that will measure the chemicals in you, that will compute and analyze and decide here is an issue and will be predictive about what that issue is and come back and fix it before it happens. Now today in mobility and hypermobility and wearables, we see it in a very clumsy way, and that is, you know, on your watch, they call it the smart watch, right? And it is, how do I take as much technology and put it on my wrist wrap it around and make it, you know, as many applications as I can on there. And we look back on that and we go, wow, that looks really clunky and, and, uh, and pretty funny. In HP Labs, we had an interesting person. They came out and they said, they're doing it all wrong. And this is back to innovation as culture. What they did is they said, they're doing it all wrong. Stand back and look at wearables. Wearables aren't anything new. They've been around for 32,000 years. For 32,000 years, they are the bracelets that you wear, the necklaces that you put on. They were the pieces of leather that you cut out, the pieces of metal that you stamped, that you wore, that were a statement about yourself, who you were. That isn't going to change. It won't change for the next however many thousand years we're here. So instead of taking the technology and putting it at the forefront, what this person had the idea to do was let's put fashion first and supplement it and make the technology disappear in the background. And that became the creation of what we call, now call engineered by HP, which has actually disappeared in the background by purpose, but it was going and doing a set of fashion devices that are not HP branded, but branded with the brands that you know today. This watch is a perfect example. This is a smart watch. It measures my, how, you know, my effectiveness at a run, my heart rate, it gives me information, but you would never know it when you look at it. It disappears in the background. And what we did here is we took an idea, we took an idea and we let it develop. We didn't squash it and say, oh, that's not the way it's done here. We started really emphasizing culture, in, a, culture excuse me, innovation is culture. The second big one is what we call 3D transformation. Now that's kind of a geeky name, but I'm a geek. So let me keep it in a simple way. This is about the next industrial revolution. And I really mean that. So let me tell you, tell you exactly what that is. So for the last 150 years, we have lived in a very simple way that has created incredible wealth for us. And that is, every product ever created followed three simple steps, four simple steps. One, we stage in raw materials and we get it in as efficiently as possible. You don't want to have too much, you don't want to have too little. We, we, we manufacture it and we do it in low cost labor. We do it in automated ways and we try and figure out the right place to do it to minimize the cost. Three, we figure out how we go uh, you know, stage it in, in warehouses and distribution centers and retail stores and we don't have too much of it. You gotta like do it in exactly the right amount. And then we gotta have really good marketing that we go across the whole thing. And if you can weave that picture together the best, you win. And it didn't matter whether you were doing Toyotas, Twinkies, or tablets. That has been our manufacturing economy for the last 150 years. Over the next 30 years, that will fundamentally and radically change. And what will enable that is the front end democratization of design. When design goes into the power of the individuals who can modify and make things, this is the beginning of what you see today as the maker revolution. But more than that, 
It is the professional guys who move from a world in which is subtractive manufacturing into an additive manufacturing, where they build things up and they design things in a fundamentally different way based on the requirements of the design. And then on the back end, it is the disruptions that will come with 3D printing and some of the unbelievable technologies we're going to see in the very near future, in the next year, in the next two years. And so suddenly, instead of you buying a traditional product because you went to Best Buy or you went over to your favorite store, you will sit at home, you will grab a design, and that design will then, you'll modify it, you'll personalize it, you'll change it, you'll press a button, and it will show up on your doorstep in exactly the way you want it in two days. Now, that may take 30 years, but I guarantee you it's coming. And you think of the disruption that that will bring. Supply chains will be fundamentally different. Tax laws will change. Government regulations will change. What happens when all of your products are no longer manufactured in the lowest cost geography? And think of the impact back on society. Remember the changes we talked about in terms of society coming. What happens when the goods come digitally into these cities and they're produced in the city itself and then the goods themselves, which are environmentally friendly, are disassembled and the waste is then put back into that area? It will fundamentally change what we do. Now, this is a cool idea, and I could really, as a nerd, I could probably talk a long time about it. But the key notion here is how that came about wasn't because me as the CTO, it wasn't because somebody else proclaimed that is the direction. It actually came from a couple interesting ideas that were deep within the organization of something that could fundamentally change. And they created a project, and that project we in HP, we call them G-jobs. A G-job is a project that starts that's not funded, right? But they somehow gets going. And that's exactly what happened here. And when we started that project, we starved it. Now, we starved it on purpose, but we encouraged them. We made them fight. We made them really go after exactly what they needed. We didn't shower them with money. We didn't shower them with people, but we gave them support. We created into the culture itself the ability to develop that idea. That is 3D transformation. The last one I want to use as an example, and then I want to switch and talk about how do we do this with our companies? How do we lead as leaders in, in, in order to drive innovation as culture? So this last one is the internet of all things. Now, we all, most of us probably heard of, you know, IOT, or Internet of Things, which is, you know, we're going to take technology and we're going to embed it in everything that we have, like our coffee maker, so that we can, you know, turn it on at the right time, or our refrigerator, or whatever it might happen to be. And then, you know, many instances, those things will happen. But what I'm talking about is a grander, bigger idea that came out of, here again, a few number of people in a small setting who said we can do things differently. And that simple idea is the internet of all things. And that is that every single thing without technology can be connected. Now, it's an interesting concept, but let me give you a simple idea. We have the ability to 3D print, and you have the ability to 3D print at credible resolution. What you can do is actually embed in patterns, invisible patterns in the parts that you print. So now you can, you can print in things like QR codes or special patterns that can only be read in one way. So now in your drug chain, all of those pills can all be encoded with a very specific pattern because the 3D printing can actually print the drugs themselves. And now I can mark them with unique patterns. And I can mark the packaging itself that it comes in with a unique pattern so I can track it through the supply chain and I can validate it as something that's a true product. Now, I never added any technology. I never put a single piece of memory. I never put any processing capability anywhere in there. But what I did is I just now tracked from the beginning of a product all the way through to the end the value of that. Or imagine the part. The part on the left that's 3D printed that I can embed codes in. I can embed invisible codes in that tell you that it is your part, that this part is owned, for example, by BMW, that it was printed or created in such and such a city, that it came off of such and such a printer. Now I know exactly where that part is, where it came from, and I can track it. Now I bring this up because I said there were three people who had an idea. 
And what they did is they went out, they took the initiative, and they created exactly that idea. They brought it to life, and they came back, and they sold it. It wasn't a proclamation from me. It wasn't on high from some manager. It was setting a culture that allowed innovation to come out and thrive. So how do we do this as a managers? At HP, HP was the original Silicon Valley startup. HP was started in 1939 in this garage. It's still around today. It's in a quiet little neighborhood in Palo Alto, completely unassuming. If you drove by it, you would not even know it was there unless you happened to stop and read the little sign that's right there. But in that garage, with $535, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard set forth to create their first product. Now, they didn't have venture capitalists at the time. They didn't have consultants. They didn't have a marketing organization or HR or anything else. They had the two of them, and they had a little cot in a shed right next to them that they slept in. And from that garage became Silicon Valley. And what they did is they imbued in the entire organization of which I am the living, breathing representative of the whole concept that to create is to innovate, to innovate has to be built into the culture. And to build it into the culture, you have got to go reward, you have got to go encourage, you have got to go make sure that those pieces cannot be stamped out. Now, I'll give you, I want to switch and give you an example. And I, I try and do these in all parts of the, the places I go. Anybody know this word? I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. There's a few people who actually know it. Uh, our, our Indian folks certainly uh, will know it. So it's called Jugard. It's a Hindi or Punjabi word that means, very simply, innovative fix. And what it really is is going to go do something and fix a problem. You know, innovation is the, or necessity is the mother of, of innovation or invention. And what it is is the idea you have a problem and you need to fix it, and you got to come up with a very creative way. And by the way, you have no money, you have no support structure, you have nothing. So how do you go about doing it? And having spent a lot of time in India, north, south, east, and west, big cities, small towns, when you take a look and you see what goes on there, and when you know the concept of Jugard and you watch what goes on there, you see innovation is culture. This is when you see the, bi the, the motorbike that's set up by the ditch, and it's got a strap around it that uses a pump to get the water out of the ditch back up to feed or to water the plants. This is the bicycle that's sitting out behind the little shed, and the guy is riding the bicycle as fast as he can so he can recharge the battery so that they can have a PC that gives them internet to the village. This is the guy on the bicycle riding down the street who's figured out how he can stack all of his bricks on the bicycle itself so he can transport the, transport the goods in a, in, in a better fashion. This is the shower head that he couldn't afford, so he grabbed a plastic bottle and jabbed holes in it and taped it on the top of the water spout so that he could create the shower head. This is Jugard. And this is exactly the innovation that we as leaders need to drive into our own organization. How do we take that fundamental need and when there is a need, figure out how you fulfill it in a unique way? And it usually doesn't come because you showered money on it or you gave them a ton of resources. You encouraged, you developed, you helped. So how do we recapture that? How do we recapture that maker spirit? How do we get back into that, into that world when life was simpler, when the company was smaller, when it was an easier way in which to operate? There weren't that many things around. And what we have to do is figure out how we capture that, how we get that back. Now, there's a few things that we've tried to do. And I'm not going to say we have it perfect. And it's one of those things that probably my biggest challenge or my biggest issue is not so much talking about the technology. I can do that. But my biggest challenge is how do I go and focus on really highlighting the degrees of innovation that are throughout all parts of the organization? 
Okay, so I'll give you an example, another example at HP. And I seek these out everywhere. And every time I find one of these, I highlight it and I bring it forth and I praise it. Simple example, we have, we do laser jets, printers. Those printers are, are uh, you know, uh, obviously world, you know, worldwide, everybody knows what a laser jet is. Well, the testing group for LaserJet, they had a budget crunch, and they, they needed to test, physically test these products. They got to lift up all the lids, they got to push all the buttons, they got to test the cables, they got to do a lot of stuff in here. So they're figuring out how they're doing it, and their budget's getting cut. So, you know, less budget, more products coming out, how do I fix this problem? Well, that team went forth and said, we know how to fix this. And what they did independently is they went and they actually 3D printed, because they had a little Dremel 3D printer, they 3D printed a little arm, they got a motor on, and they took a little piece of, of uh, uh, Visual Basic, and they created a little program that allowed the arm to move the motor, that allowed them to push a button. And then they took that one, and they said, geez, I can add in another one, so they printed a different 3D part, added another motor, they had two parts together, and they figured out they could lift up lids. And then they did it again, and they did it again, and they did it again, and eventually what they had is they had an entire suite of 3D printed arms, gadgets, devices, along with a set of motors, and they developed an entire software toolkit. And they could do all of their testing in a very simple, repeated, automated way. Nobody told them to do that. No manager came on high and said, thou shalt do it. It was an idea of one person of what could be done. Now, they've taken that idea and they've created a whole robotics platform. And what was a simple, boring test lab is now the basis of an entire robotics effort. And the key is, back to innovation is culture. Taking those little pieces within our organization and amplifying them. So how do we do that? And I'm gonna give you just a handful of, uh, of things that we focus on. One, Prepare yourself. You've got to look for these opportunities. You have to see them. And when it becomes time of change, you have to be prepared to act. You know, we always you know, talk about somebody move my cheese. Well, in all of this, you have to imbue within people that that is part of progress, is actually when your cheese is moved. Embrace that. Prepare people for that. Second, communicate. Communicate clearly a vision, communicate a direction, and communicate it regularly. But it's a communication of where you're going, not how to get there. Now, you'll create the roadmap as you go, but when somebody is moving in that direction, you want to encourage them, you want to help them, you do not want to let process get in the way. Process is an assistant. It is not the way to get there. It is really important. Process becomes a mechanism by which you achieve something, not the end. It is really critical. So when you communicate that vision, you have a chance then for them to see where they're going in that direction. Third, empower them. Empower them to make the decisions. Know that they can. And every time they do, every opportunity, you highlight it. You emphasize it. You celebrate it, and you do it in public ways. Bring it out so that they know innovation is not something that I own as CTO. It's not something that the CEO proclaims from on high. Innovation is that innovative approach in HR, that different approach how, how we go to market, that different approach of how we think about products. It is all aspect of culture. And finally, suspend Judgment, really critical. Oh, we can't do that, we tried that. Sometimes the greatest, the best ideas come out of people who didn't know you couldn't do that. And if you spend all of your time talking about, oh, well, you can't do that, or we tried that, or you know, that doesn't work, if all of your energy goes into that, it won't work. So you have to celebrate and encourage. So I want to come back to the beginning. I want to come back to that time when you were a child, or that time when I was a child, when you really did believe everything was possible, when you really thought you could create anything. 
You know, when you were that kid and you had that dream where you strapped on the cape, you put on that pair of goggles, you put on whatever it was that made you become superhuman. I want to come back and I want to remember that because it is that spirit, it is that thinking, it is that direction that we want to imbue on our organization. And when we can get that and we can get that bright-eyed energy back into what we do, and we can do it in a broad way, then you know you've driven innovation into the very culture of what we do. So remember, innovation is culture. Thank you.